these sneaky, clever game designers and artists, they just make it look so easy. They make it look so easy to make the world's best-selling video game. <laughs> Check it out. Today we're gonna to be taking a look at Tears of the Kingdom. This is the latest Zelda game, uh, basically. And we're, we're, we're artists here uh, on my channel. I am an artist, I'm a concept artist. I have worked in video games on some of the world's biggest video games. I have a little bit of insight into exactly like how these kind of games are made from a concept artist perspective. So I'm gonna be looking at the the art book that came with the collector's edition. First of all, I was very fortunate enough to get a copy of the collector's edition. These things were sold out the moment they announced them. I do have a misprint. The logo's printed upside down, but hey, the quality of the book is really good and it's mostly production art. Thank you, Nintendo. Usually what we get is a bunch of flashy illustrations that really aren't to anything to do with the game's development at all. They're just pretty pictures. So this is these videos are particularly useful uh, for people who are aspiring to make video games or do concept art for video games or work in video games. This is that's what my channel is about. Making video games, making comics, writing novels. That's what I do. Primarily what I talk about in this video series, and I have a bunch of these about recent releases. And primarily what I talk about is, you know, things like laying out the the turnarounds for characters and like how to present designs in a way that's functional. And we talk about shape language and storytelling in our designs. And we also talk about the technique. And in fact, if you want to learn how to draw and color in an anime style like this, you can check out my free digital artist starter kit or, or check this out, the ultimate tutorial for basics of anime style. You can watch my videos about how to draw Naruto. <laughs> yes. You're never too advanced to go back to the fundamentals of drawing in different art styles. This is an art style that's very distinctly different from something like a Diablo or a World of Warcraft or even a League of Legends. I mean, Zelda has its own anime flavor. And those videos really break down exactly this process. You wanna draw like this? I taught you how in last week's video, two of them. Uh, so I, I wanted to break down the process. It's one of my favorite things to do is to look at something, analyze it, dissect it. How does it work? How can I make it better? How can I infuse that, mix that with things that worked in other games that I really like? And I wanna get right to it. This is a very exciting thing. By the way, uh, this video is gonna be a long one. These videos always are. So let's dig into it. All right, let's get started. Uh, the first one is we're gonna take a look at some of the character design sheets. Now, this is what I was talking about when I was saying production art. You're gonna hear me harp on this many, many times over. Production art is the art that's necessary for the game's development. You know, production art sometimes looks like illustration. Sometimes that's when you see the, the box art will come out from the production art. They're just the early blue sky explorations. That's where you get the really beautiful rendered, highly rendered paintings. But most of game development looks like this. If you are a budding concept artist and you want to be a character designer, even for indie games, you're gonna have to have stuff that looks like this in your portfolio. Most specifically, you'll notice we have front view, right? We have side view with the arm cut away because why? We need to see the details of his belt, right? Uh, and back view, right? And on top of that, that's not where we stop. Oh uh -uh, man, we dig into stuff like this, all the little details. And basically what this is, is a character design sheet. This is not the marketing materials. This is not the stuff you see on Kotaku or IGN. Ain't nobody putting this on the front cover of an art station, but I'll tell you what, if you don't have this in your portfolio, you're not gonna get hired as a concept artist at most, let's say, uh, studios that know what they're doing, okay? Because there's a lot of game studios who do not know what they're doing and they will fumble around in the dark for months on end and that's why you end up with games that take eight to 10 years to develop. Now, if you're really trying to be efficient with your concept art design, you wouldn't start with this, you start with thumbnails. And I've, I've talked a lot about this in my workshops on character design and on environment design. You start with thumbnails and you look for the silhouette, the style, the, the, what is this telling the player? Like, what does this symbolize? And, and how is it distinctly different from the lineup of the rest of the outfits? Now, I designed over 70% of the armor sets for Diablo 3, and I had to have a lineup of all of them as I added new ones. Is this one looking really distinctly different from the other armor sets? And if it didn't, and if it looked too similar to another armor set, uh, get it out of there. Before you go and invest in doing turnarounds, and all of your multiple angles and your breakdowns of pieces with the patterns in them and all that, before you even get to that, 
you have to have the thumbnail and how does that thumbnail line up next to the rest of your character designs. And that's why things like this are important, by the way, because once you get into doing all the details of things, that's when the modeler is gonna wanna know, well, let's see, you know, what's the shape language on these? We talk about shape language a lot in concept art. The hell is shape language? You know, are you speaking in, in symbols? No, man, I'm talking about quite literally, well, yeah, I guess it is kind of like speaking in symbols. If you have a lot of these shapes and there, there's an echo of that in other parts of your design, such as uh, here, you'll see it again. This is the echoing, the circle with the rounded thing and then the wings coming off of it. You see that echoed here, that is shape language, as in you are defining what it, uh, what consistency of shapes and materials you're using across your whole design. And if this arm piece here does not have the same shape language as other parts on the character's armor, it will look like the character is pulling from multiple sort of maybe scavenged armor pieces from multiple different sets, but they won't feel like the same set. That's why we have these eye shapes that are uh, represented here and then this almost Aztec influenced stuff you see the same kind of shapes going on down here where it looks like eyes this whole piece that's mirrored looks like that that's shape language baby that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about shape language that is good character design that is good armor design now does it still look like link not identifiably you know truth be told if you were to show this to somebody uh, and say hey this is this is link from Legend of Zelda, if you were, especially like if you were to show somebody from the Ocarina of Time era before Link could ever change his outfit, his costume, you would think that's not Link. What is that's something else entirely, right? But because we know that this is a game where you are changing out your costuming, you get a different torso piece, you get different legs, uh, pants, and you get a different helmet. Those are, or hat, you know, and those are the three distinct armor pieces that you can get in a set to create a set, which is brilliant, by the way. Some games go further than that and they'll say, oh, pauldrons are separate from the chest plate and all oh, the pants are different from the, the, the boots or something like that. And you, you have to tune your designs towards how those sets are being created. With Diablo, we had gear sets, which basically meant like, uh, yeah, I would design it like as if you had the full set and I think it had several different pieces to that. It was the, the helmet, the chest, the pauldrons, the boots, the legs, the pants. All that was totally separate parts. But then we had these geo sets where some of it was fixed to geometry. You couldn't even change the geometry. So sometimes you have to be thinking about technical constraints such as the polygons. Uh, you know, if you can't add new polygons to it, it's really tough to get a distinct new look. Sometimes that's like uh, when you were in high school, maybe. I don't know if you guys did this, but I would get these like cut out almost paper doll looking uh, T pose of, of superhero bodies and you could just draw in with crayons or whatever. Like this is when you're a kid, you know, like designing your own superhero and it's just, oh, this is just a different pattern on the same body, you know, the same tights, you know, basically. And sometimes doing skin design or armor sets is exactly just that. Uh, but one thing to be uh, note, uh, to take note of is that also other other armor sets and other outfits are handled the same way. Now, probably uh, this was drawn over geometry of Link's face, probably. They maybe rendered out a, a, the model, it's cell shaded. So you render that out and then you can draw over the top of it. You rotate the model and your proportions are always gonna be the same, but when you're doing the concept art, you have to think about things like, uh, how is this rope you know, uh, going to connect on the other side? Because if this suddenly like, some people, and you have to be mindful of this, a lot of times when people are doing their character design stuff, they won't think about how it's gonna look from the back. And, and this is such a small thing because it's a simple character design, this, um, I guess, toga or whatever you call it. But it's it, it, if you don't have that consistency and this isn't here, like let's say that you just forget to put the rope connecting across this back, then the modeler is gonna get it and go, well, wh where does the rope go? Like, I mean, sure, you can fill in the blanks and it's nice when you're used to working with a team that knows what blanks to fill in but you know sometimes you're working with a modeler that's very meticulous about these things and they're like you know they may think that this suddenly goes through a loop in the back and then it's attached up here and if that's not clear then i mean sure you could you could make the argument well some things are obvious right not to everybody and when you're a concept artist you can't assume that some things are obvious 
you have to be quite literal. So I have many, many character design sheets, especially on Diablo and League of Legends. I have many character design sheets of exactly this process of drawing out the character from the front, the side, the back, and then close-ups of specifics, like how does that boot fit around his legs? We need to see it, you know? And that's why it's important for you to, to think about this, even in your portfolio, if you just have flashy paintings and flashy images of, you know, whatever it is that you like to draw, even if they're, you know, fan drawings of, of another existing character, it's like, that's not gonna do it. But getting stuff like this in your portfolio increases your chances of even being noticed by game developers by like more than 50%. And now I don't speak for them, but I can tell you that it's, it's absurd the amount of portfolios that still go out where people are going, well, I just put together my paintings of my dog or whatever, and then they send those out. That's not really applicable to game design or game development. And that's why we take a look at these videos. These, this video series, whether you know it or not, is one of the most valuable things that you could be looking at for at least understanding what you should be, what you should be looking at. <laughs> don't, don't just look at the, the games and the art books that I'm pointing to, uh, but, but what, what these are designed to do is to get you thinking about how are these drawings that they put in their art book, how are those useful for game development, you know? And, and for example, like when we look at a shot like this, by the way, I apologize for the glare. It was really, really not easy to get a, a clean shot. There's really glossy paper with shiny ink, you know. I did what I could. I did what I could, guys. <laughs> Bear with me a little. But we're looking at the content anyway. And you might be looking at a piece like this and going, well, dude, like, just put some, just put some detail in. Like, it's a root. Obviously, it's a root. But like, why didn't they render it the way that, you know, even, even when I do art contests on my Discord channel and, and we do like challenges to design shrines for Zelda, it's like, even everybody that's a student tends to put more time and care into their art than the stuff that we see here. And, and by the way, I don't want to bust on the Nintendo developers here. They had to make a massive world. Now, what's surprising to me is that when they were putting together the art book that they decided to use a piece that's kind of small like this, like, uh, or what, I, what I'm trying to say is like, this should have been a thumbnail, like in, in a series of sketches of areas that are like this, because that's that's how they should be presented. We Usually uh, artists or people who are, are not artists won't look at something like this and be very impressed. But as a game developer, I can tell you that stuff like this is very useful and it is very functional and every concept art piece starts like this. Every, I'm gonna say that again. Every environment concept art piece starts like this. The idea, the storytelling, what's going on here. This tree is alive. It is like those uh, temples in Thailand, those old ancient temples You've got these like kind of Aztec symbols that imply this ancient uh, uh, culture. And by the way, that ties into some of the armor we were looking at earlier in this very video. It ties it together so your subconscious mind goes, oh, the shape language is the same. Maybe this is like a temple entrance from that same group of people. I would have a real hard time not going in <laughs> and like detailing all of these pieces with the same, like the, the, they do that kind of thing like this. I would, I would have a hard time not going in and detailing these things out. And I, would, I wish I could talk to some of the concept artists. If, if any of you out there know the concept artists that worked on this, and if they speak English, I would love to talk with them uh, here on my channel about some of, I don't know if they can. I mean, a lot of game development studios, they don't let their concept artists out of their cage, you know? Um, and I shouldn't say it like that, but if they're able to speak to the, you know, somebody on YouTube about it, I'd love to chat. I'd love to even just, you know, chat offline to find out more information about their, their thought process and, and how much of a time uh, pressure they were under. Sometimes you're really only getting like a few days to do, uh, you know, entire zones, an entire island, you know, for example, or an entire dungeon. Like oftentimes with Diablo 3, I would only get about a month to design like 20 or 30 different parts of like different rooms and uh, culture kits and, and props. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit, but um, all this stuff, like you know, not getting the time, is that frustrating for the artist to not get the time to go in and put in the, the, the to be a painter? Like what is a concept artist? 
What the hell does a concept artist do if it's not about making beautiful paintings, right? That's what we're trying to dissect here on this channel. And that's what I'm trying to hopefully infuse at least the notion that it's not just about pretty paintings, even though standards are very high, the expectations are very high. There's also um, the only, I would say that the only people that are going to appreciate this kind of work are going to be game developers, directors, art directors, game directors, producers, designers would love this because you get something like this in a couple of hours. And one of the things that people in other disciplines get frustrated with artists about is that artists want to go, no, 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 I need like two weeks to do that. It's like, well, what if we don't like what you gave us in two weeks? I've already forgotten about my freaking idea that I wanted to get into the game, you know, that I described to you and you took two weeks to like visualize it. Something like this, you can literally come out of a meeting, go to your desk and whip up and bring it back to that designer. That designer can go, yeah, like that. Yeah, you know. Um, or no, maybe maybe like, you know, not these shapes, but maybe we want like round cylinders. And that's oftentimes what an art director would do. You don't always get the benefit of a, a hands-on art director who's going to do that though. And oftentimes I found with some of the game studios I've worked at, if you were to do sketches this loose and present them to the whole team of non-artists and people that are not in charge in a hierarchical sort of a structure, then you will get your pieces rejected and somebody who's done a more highly rendered piece can um, can usually they'll get their pieces approved. So it's important to somehow find that blend. I don't recommend putting something like this in your portfolio unless you've got a whole sheet, like, you know, like one of your pages is, you know, uh, six of these and then like maybe a large one at the bottom, something that stands out, you know, think of it like a comic book page or, you know, just presentation wise. Uh, rule of thirds and all that. You guys already know all that stuff, baby stuff. It's kindergartner stuff. Everybody in middle school and elementary school could do that, right? Here we've got, I don't know if this is even the drawing. This looks like just a rendering of the character. And this is one of those kind of things that you'll see in a lot of, uh, I'd say, you know, like uh, Japanese art books, you know, is like uh, you get renders from the 3D models. Not as useful uh, for us to study. Uh, however, however, I would say when looking at her design, there are some things I wanted to point out, specifically color balance. So what we have here is this blue, gold, brown, and like a, a dark gray, right? And we have it in clusters. There's these large clusters across her torso, right? Kind of creates, when you squint your eyes, you see this like collection of a, almost a large shape. This is probably the most prominent like shape and it's, you need at least one spot on your character that has this place for what I would, I term like a place for the viewer's eye to rest. And what that just means is there's not a lot of detail going on there. And it's also, it's, it's like a large clump of something, a large cluster of a solid body. And then you have your more minuscule details peppered in between. So you'll notice like you get a little more detail in this leather strap around her waist, but also there's this sense that that blue shirt is actually just underneath. There's layering. There's definitely a feeling of layering with her. And also, interesting that, to my knowledge, and, you know, I don't think it's a spoiler, but, like, to my knowledge, no Triforce in Hyrule, in this era, this Breath of the Wild slash Tears of the Kingdom era, and yet, very, very distinctly, Try force. So that is odd. That is um, an odd choice. Perhaps roll over simply to previous Zeldas, possibly hinting at something in the future. There's so much uh, subtlety I've noticed in the designs, everything down to things like floral patterns, implying a more peaceful lifestyle, less warlike. She almost has a feeling of royalty, usually with these ornate, uh, sort of hairstyles that is like a, a symbol of royalty because especially in sort of a medieval era of time which is it's Hyrule is not a medieval era of time but it's sort of I mean we've got castles and we've got like knights right okay so uh, definitely they're they're hearkening to that and and with the sophisticated sort of um, 
uh, braiding that's going on in her hair and elegance and, and opulence of her dress, she looks royal. In fact, a lot of the characters in this game are royal. And in fact, we will talk about some of them as we progress through. What is this image for? I don't, I, I really couldn't tell you. Although if you were a concept artist and you were looking at this, the thing to take away here is maybe you don't need all the little like breakdowns of all the gear, but at least have that three quarter back, three quarter front. And if you need help with this, screw it. Use like a generic uh, model of a, like a 3D character for your posing. I mean, these guys, it, they cheat. They, you know, it's mostly about the design anyway. Production art is all about the design. It's all about the final result. It doesn't matter how you get there. Um, and I was talking earlier about props and the importance of props. And I will say, I know this, this, might, this might break some people's hearts, but it's like concept art, okay? Yes, you're gonna get a lot of jobs doing things like this. You're gonna get a lot of jobs drawing trees, designing like rock formations and little contraptions. This, there's actually a lot too. Like if you can, if you can dig, and I mean like, not just like, like, like it, not like, like, like it, but like dig it. If you can really make this your jam, where you love to design lanterns and you love to design uh, carts, unique ways to like look like crates from all different genres sci-fi crates old wooden medieval crates fantasy crates steampunk crates um yeah you know, whatever cyberpunk crates like if you if you become a master of designing crates and lanterns and chairs and tables and hookahs and popcorn makers and vending machines and if you can become like the person who just loves digging into the, those kind of things integrated into an existing universe with the technology they have, with the logic that they have, with the biology that they have. If they're alien, they'd use different kind of buttons for their vending machines. If, they're, uh, if they power everything off of a gas instead of electricity, like all those factors of storytelling and like working into like, what is this world and what do I want to say about it? If you can dig on that, you will find work. And that's not something that's just taught. It's something that you you dig into and you learn and you begin to explore. And those are the kind of things that, that you should have in your portfolio. Even if you're a character designer and you're like, ah, I don't do props, I don't do environments. I just wanna like do characters. You know what? Why? Why limit yourself to that? Like the most competitive, it's like saying, I, I wanna play football, pro football, but I'll only be the quarterback. It's the only role I want to play as a quarterback. Uh, this I thought I put this in here specifically because I thought, well, one, this is a paint over. So they took the landmass, and I, and I imagine, by the way, so this is a game that has like these. It's kind of like Pokemon as well. The latest, uh, uh, not Arceus. Well, yeah, Arceus was like this too, but uh, they they can kind of sculpt to the ground, and so what you get is like you know areas that are raised up, cliff sides. Um, and then they place prop boulders and whatnot in that space. And maybe the designer, the game designer, game play designer would go into, or the level designer possibly would go in and like put in primitive shapes for like, you know, this um, staircase right here. And then the game designer might say, yeah, there's a, you know, the the tower or the, the shrine is right here. And they probably have that, that, that polygon, that the object that they place into the space. And then they would hand over this kind of like really what we call a gray box, but sometimes it's it's just the landscape. And it just has, you know, those primitive shapes and like, you know, the geometry that's been extruded from the ground plane, you know. And, and if you've played around a little bit with Unreal, then you'll know what I'm talking about, especially with their landscaping uh, tools, you know, just extruding up geometry. And maybe like, maybe the, the level designer would have put in where the path is supposed to be. But they're sort of general expressions of what's important to the player for that part. And then they hand that over to the concept artist and they say, go to town. Like, here's here's the location. Here's a little description about the weather up there or if there are any factors like, um, well, you know, there's, there's probably going to be like more lakes in this area or we need to have more, um, I don't know, ruins, old ruins, because this is part of in the lore like this is a, an area that's like ancient and maybe it had been raised you know raised up or something like that and so you might get those kind of like visual cues 
from that. And then you have to sort of incorporate that. So, you know, you could have like also just as easily went, well, hey, you know, like these structures over here, you know, maybe we have these, you know, pieces of the these ancient temples sticking out of the walls, for example, you know, like that. That's not an unreasonable thing for an artist to just add. And then as the game designer gets it back, they would go through and, and decide, okay, well, maybe the, the player, we, we don't want the player to be able to climb up that surface, or maybe, um, you know, we'll add more rain to this area. So it's, it's like harder to access some of these zones. And it's a little bit of a back and forth, like game development really is a conversation between the different disciplines, between the psychology of the game designer and the uh, artistry and the, the sort of free thinking, blue sky thinking of an artist and the uh, the player, all, all sort of creating this chemistry to communicate a story and an intention to the player of what they want the player to do. Things like colors really play a role as well. So uh, before I cancel that, before I close that, things like colors really play a role here. So uh, an area that's particularly like golden like this, it doesn't look very threatening or dangerous. You know, there's something else to think about is like, you know, what emotion do we want to evoke in the player, you know? Um, golden trees like this sort of imply a royal or royalty or a, a, a treasure, right? You know, there's like generally like streets of gold, right? Heavenly, you know, this is something almost spiritual. And then, and yet you have all this overgrowth. So it's like teeming with life, you know, it's, it's, these things are comfortable for humans. Like, uh, but if you, if you had it barren and all this was like lava rock and that's what they did with Hyrule Castle. If you've played the game, you know what I'm talking about. There's like lava rock everywhere, and it's no it's no mystery why they made this. Um, there's a I've forgotten what the what they call it in the game, but there's a a, a phantom um, like a, a red glowing mist or a red glowing like it almost looks like the earth is injured, and it's like pulsating out, and it actually causes a different kind of a damage to the player that sort of knocks out hearts from your your uh, progression and or from your health bar. And those things, it's not a mystery why that's red. Red implies danger. Red implies hostility. It, reply, it, it almost like subconsciously our human brains go red, orange, like it's like fire, but gold. Gold is treasure, you know, especially with round shapes, with a lot of nature. So these things are, uh, these things are important to think and uh, keep in mind when you're designing. And some of you might be working on a painting right now. Maybe I know a lot of people tune into my channel while they're painting just to kind of have something to listen to that's that's getting them thinking while they're doing what they're doing. So ask yourself about the painting you're doing right now. You know, is what you're doing right now telling the story and creating the emotion that you want? And and if you don't, if it's not, think backwards and start to think, well, what do I want the player to feel in a shot like this? That's what people are looking for when they look at art and when they look at a video game and when they're playing a video game, they want a feeling. They can't, that's why they can't describe it because um, it's something that they want, they know once they feel it, once they see it. You have to, that's your job to come up with that and create that. Shots like this are really helpful for game development. One of the things I wanted to point out, painted over geometry. In fact, you can see it here. Look, they just like painted over the tree. It's important for your designs to fit into the universe that you're uh, designing for. If you're ever working at a game studio and you do something like this, where you're like, no, like let's say you're an environment concept artist and you're like, oh, I just sketched in real quick, sketched in a door. It's kind of loose like this. If you get in any kind of like trouble for that, find a way to slowly step out the door from that game development because if you don't you might end up stuck there for years and they won't value what you do but great design does not require tons of time just in the rendering okay i have said that for years i have said that on now admittedly who knows maybe if i did like highly rendered you know paintings of, of if for every damn door that i ever designed or whatever maybe i'd be a much more famous artist i don't know but maybe that's what it takes who knows i look at this as a game developer and i go i can see exactly how that's supposed to look in game and when you see it like in contrast to the actual in-game shot it's like this is the essential information this is the important stuff we see that there's a there's a like a hinge right here 
And then this drawbridge actually like ties that up, pulls that up through here. I'm surprised they didn't do like a breakdown of, of what the contraption inside is, but maybe we don't even see the contraption inside. But it's really important they have these like call outs. This is something I learned on the very first game that I ever worked on. And I wouldn't have known that. I might have gone through an art book like this and skipped right over this. I don't need to know that stuff. That's baby stuff. That's stuff I was doing in elementary school. It's not even a good drawing. Thinking to myself that I knew better. Thinking to myself, oh yeah, like, you know, why didn't they just put the care into the painting, the drawing? Because that's not what people give a shit about. What people care about is the final game. Is that an interesting design? Is that a cool place to go to? Does it evoke the emotion that I want? That's what they care about. And what you need to think of as a designer, as, a, as an environment concept artist, is you need to be thinking about, like, is this going to serve the needs of the designer? And is it going to be enough information for the 3D modeler to be able to build it? And is the player going to be like get the desired emotion or idea of what they're supposed to do in this location? And what does it mean? For example, this is fortified. This is not like a, hey, we just set up camp here. They built this to defend their walls, okay? They're not particularly well defended, but they do have cutouts for archers, you know? Uh, to climb up on top they obviously have like big uh fire brazers so they're going to have these, these signals that they're going to send to other fortresses that are maybe on the horizon right um it's obviously they need to it sometimes close the drawbridge what kind of things are they fighting against here you know you got moblins like packs of moblins right outside their door it's a reasonable amount of defense for the type of enemies that you will encounter in hyrule field it is not a reasonable amount of defense for enemies that you will fight in other places in the game. And those places get smashed, you know, and they are they're adequately destroyed based on the types of enemies that are in those surroundings. That is incredible. Like that level of... Can we just stop and appreciate that, that level of thought? For a sketch, for a doodle, a doodle that many artists out there will look at and go, I could draw that. But can you think about it? Like, can you think about, can you plan for all the storytelling that I was just talking about? Can you plan for all those things too? Will you care enough about the game to think that deeply about the world building that you're doing? And what gets crazy is when you get beyond just the level of these basic uh, needs or necessities or basic levels of storytelling, when you start digging into what if they were mining precious materials? What if they had to, what if they had big tanks that they needed a bigger gate to be able to get them through? Like, how would they build those? Like, they're using wood because they're in a forest that's surrounded by all this wood, right? Same kind of wood too, I think. But my point being, they're not using something that they don't have available to them. God, they even have these walls fortified. Look, if you dig in, you look a little deeper, look, the way that, What's cool about this concept is it shows you how it's constructed. And by the way, also, this is a Japanese game developer designing Western looking medieval towers and walls and stuff. Like there's there's something there. It's cool. I, I, people will be like, why did you spend so much time on that one? That's not even a cool drawing. Well, it's pretty freaking amazing to me how it turned out in the game anyway. And I don't care. This is about my appreciation for <laughs> a damn good game. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. I don't care about views anymore, man. I don't even care. Uh, stuff like this is really nice too, by the way. Uh, for your portfolio, you might want to consider, like this is just charming AF, man. Like, look at that. We got Link like standing there holding his armor and stuff for this other guy who's polishing. What is that? Is he doing polishing his helmet? Yeah, polishing his helmet, sitting on a pile of armor. That's just like, that's just some artist digging his job or her job. Like that's just somebody just, I'm digging it, you know? Like, character and I, I i my japanese is too poor i can't read kanji but yeah uh, shots like this like just these extras these characters that you'll just see around town this is what he looks like more casual this is what he looks like same guy same look same model in fact this was drawn over the same pose and so is this one look same guy this is like what's underneath possibly or alternate outfit. Yeah, it's just alternate outfit. Cause look, the boots the same. Maybe they didn't use it. What's really interesting by the way is that everything in the art book is used. 
And I have to wonder, did they take everything that they didn't use? Are they just saving that for sequels? Like Nintendo doesn't do anything by accident in that way. They certainly, like I've gone through some Metal Gear uh, books, art books, and they will have stuff that was cut from the game in the art book. And I do that in my art books, like the World of Twilight Monk art book has a bunch of stuff that's not even gonna be in the game. You know, I didn't get to it, didn't get into the game. I'm saving it for something in the future. But like Nintendo guards everything pretty close to the vest. So, um, but anyway, yeah, almost everything you see is in the game. Have, it, having having extras and having like the people that, it, that populate an environment, uh, like designing their outfits as well, just as important as designing your heroes, by the way. But one thing that's very important to remember is that they're not distinct. This is um, pretty simple, pretty bland, pretty simple character design. And that's quite intentional. We're not supposed to think that this guy is like, you know, the hero, I guess is what I'm saying. If he were the hero, he'd have a lot more elaborate, ornate stuff going on. Oh man, yeah. Look at that. Okay. Why not not a man, not the rendering. <laughs> okay, dudes. Not the rendering. But the design, the shape language, look at what's happening here. This is that pattern that we saw in that very first armor set. There's a reason I started on that image because it is the foundation by which all of this stuff is built. The construction of these little squares coming together to form triangles, uh, into circular patterns. The way that these shapes fit together for this little piece right here, you could extrapolate the shape language and the construction of every part of this building and make a thousand islands out of it. Just like the salad dressing, thousand island. That's a bad joke. <laughs> I'm gonna keep it. <laughs> this one is really cool because we see this is this is raw production art and by the way this is this is in of in in of itself a character design lesson look at this the the turnarounds they draw out okay so this is the bottom of the chin this is the top of the head top of the head bottom of the chin top of the head bottom of the chin Seeing what I'm doing here, that's how you have to present your turnarounds. It's how you get consistency of your proportions and the scale of things. Every great animation, every great character design for a video game has a turnaround like this so that you can see the front, back, and side. At the very least, sometimes you get to do these three-quarter views. That's almost, this is almost purely indulgent for the artist. This is the meat and potatoes for the 3D modeler because they literally can scan that, put that into the background of their Maya file or whatever 3D package they're using to model their character, and they can one-to-one -one match what you designed from the front, side, and back. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. These guys are, uh, so this, this guy is part of an orchestra or traveling minstrels, and you have to you have to carry them to some of the fairies, the great fairies, uh, or transport them. Uh, I don't need to go into the story of it too much other than to just say, it does communicate that. You know, I mean, he's, he's like a traveling troubadour type of a guy. He's got the, look, he's got the foofy, the foofy ends of his, uh, his, his shirt, you know, around the wrists. Like these are, even this little decorative little Moogle cotton ball at the end of his toes is, this guy's not a fighter. He's not a warrior, he's not a soldier. He's, he, you know, the only other thing he could pass as is maybe like some kind of a, like a train uh, conductor <laughs> or uh, like a ticket taker. He kind of reminds me of Dindle from, um, from the first novel I wrote. I took another shot of it because I thought, wow, we really need to see that straight on. Yeah, look at the appreciation here. Like, look at this. Let's just appreciate it for a second is what I'm saying. Like, it, all the information's there. There's no question about like, what does he look like from the back? Or look, it's important to know that this little thing right here is like tying it in the back to like, so his, his cape is not just floating around, you know? Um, I don't know, just all those, all those little details, like getting the multiple angles really shows that you've thought out your design very well. Of course we have Impa. She is <laughs> got this really cool uh, hat and this design, by the way, that's very synonymous with Zelda, this kind of eye with a tear coming down. 
uh, which kind of implies she's like a sage, basically, you know, um, somebody of great importance in the world of Zelda. She's not an extra. You don't put the kind of symbology of your, your you know, ancient magics or cultures or whatever into a character that's just an, an extra, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so she's obviously really important and walks on these super high heel things, which is a very, these are called geita in Japanese, I believe. And, uh, and they usually aren't that tall, but there were some people that, that did do that. And I thought it was interesting to put this in here as well, because we also, just like what I was saying before, where we're looking at the front and the back view. There's no questions about her character design here. She has a consistency to her design. The, the pieces that start in the front wrap around to the back. And uh, I thought this was also interesting that the artist felt it necessary to show, well, a lot of times she just walks with her brim down, you know, and in this ironically, like she, they just changed her hand. So she's like, but it's important to note, like if that's an aspect of the character that is very representative of the way that they're going to behave or walk or animate. Uh, early in my career, I was working on a, a game called Maximo 3 was never released, but one of the things that I would do with my character designs is that I would include like sketches of how these characters would move, how they would interact with the player, how they would drag their swords and then swing them, you know, using momentum. And that was an important part of the character, you know, uh, the way a character moves could make them so distinctly different from another character. So as the character designer, you do have to think about that as well. I think this is really interesting how there's like curtains around her her hat like this. And you'll notice that from the back view, they don't draw that. So remember that if you're doing something where you're drawing a character and something is concealing part of the design on the back, this is the important part about uh, production art and concept art is that you have to be thinking about what information the modeler will need to to do the to actually build this in 3D. And we can't be lazy about those things. And, and the more you show that in your portfolio, the more it's going to really convince them that you're the best person for that job because you're going to be thinking about how to make the modeler's jobs easier. That is your job as a concept artist on a video game. And in fact, uh, here, without putting so much effort into it, look, they didn't do a full render drawing, but they show you, this artist shows you how that curtain closes so that we just have an understanding of it. Maybe she never even does that. I think there is a part in the Breath of the Wild where she does. Uh, oh no, it was in uh, Skyward Sword, different version of Impa. But anyway, uh, we need to understand how it works, that it closes. And in fact, you know, we got Mad Max going on outside here. Um, we need to see like how these curtain things close. And in fact, there's little notes. I encourage you with your concept art portfolio to put little notes throughout the whole thing of exactly like things that function differently. And, and if there, if you need to explain something, do a little doodle of how that works like this. I don't know what that's for. What does that mean? She has like a butt flap. What is that? <laughs> Cause this is for the back. So I guess her outfit has a butt flap. And then also like even showing like how the, the, uh, parts of cloth might fold as they rest at her side, for example, you know, uh, those things are those things are important in your portfolio. And I wanted to end on this image because this is such an iconic look for Link. And I wanted to dissect just a couple of things about it. One, we will notice we were looking at Zelda, Princess Zelda earlier, and she was wearing the same color of blue. I, I pointed it out and I and I didn't even realize it at the time, but I, I want to make a mental note of that. It's like they are obviously mirrored. They are, in a sense, uh, connected in that way. They dress similarly. Even the leather uh, around the waist, it's like the construction of their outfit is similar, even though Link is definitely more of the soldier, more of the knight. And one of the things that you'll notice about this particular um, game, and by the way, this, this costuming doesn't show it because his hair is tied back, but his hair is more wild. And he looks more like a like a savage wild lands kind of a, a a fighter now, almost like a barbarian, like a not a strong barbarian, but like a more of a wild kid, you know, like a Peter Pan type of a. Uh, he has just a feralness to him, which is not represented in this outfit at all. This almost I think this is the Breath of the Wild outfit, uh, if I recall correctly, but definitely still uh, hearkening back to it being a knight's outfit, the chainmail 
chain mail that is underneath his blue. Now this is when we talk about shape language, we also have to talk about that material language, right? What are we communicating? Now by having the blue shirt that goes over everything and then having peaks of this uh, chain mail underneath, we are communicating that this is a knight. This is a character who's armored up, even though it's slender armor, he's not muscular, he's not a brawler, he's not on a war hammer. He is, he is a young boy, like he is a young man. So he is agile. He's going to be jumping around, flipping around, flying around, okay? He glides through the air. We don't want to have a big tanky guy gliding through the air with agility and turning. It's awkward and weird and it doesn't connect. Um, but all these extra belts, very, very uh, um, uh, Final Fantasy VII, right? <laughs> Are we getting into the Nomura level of belts here? It's pretty close, I'd say. We're, we're pushing the envelope or almost into Nomura territory on the number of belts for this guy. But they do make sense, you know? Uh, we've got uh, the strap on the back for his sword, and obviously they kind of fake this. You know, it's, it's one of those suspension of disbelief that we accept when the character has a weapon that's way too big for them on their back, but we accept it. Uh, there's really nice layering here in the way that these materials connect under his arm. I'm gonna zoom in to really analyze this. There's this uh, patterning that almost looks like Triforce, the triangular shapes. This, there is a Triforce symbol on him. So there must have been in the history of even this Hyrule, they must have already had access to the Triforce or some legend about it. There's the classic uh, wings on his shoulder. This is, everything about this is distinctly Link. This is like your iconic, like 2020 version of Link. This is not your 1982 version of Link. This is not your 1990s version of Link. This is not your uh, uh, Wind Waker, even though you can get a mask, by the way, a little spoiler there. You can get, you can look like the Wind Waker uh, in this game, but this is the new modern uh, link and, and everything about his design communicates that, but it still communicates that history hearkening back to the very first Zelda game that I got when I was only, I think, seven years old or eight years old and um, played the heck out of that game. But it, this, is, this is still hearkening back to all those things and that gives you the feels, especially if you have nostalgia. You want to play, uh, I've, I've, I've done a little bit of work on remakes and remasters and sequels and when you're working with redesigning a classic character it's so important and integral that you get the nostalgia for the audience that you pull from things that they're expecting that are familiar the blonde hair the blue eyes for this guy the he always had the the sideburns that hung down and sometimes would have like actual like rings in them he always had the elf ears this is a character that you cannot suddenly change that. And we've seen that with some games like Bionic Commando. They tried to redo that. Bomberman, they tried to like modernize it and changed his design away from all the things that made him iconic. You can't just take Mega Man and like suddenly make him a 40 year old man. You cannot do that. I did a, 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 a Zelda or a, a Link redesign where he was an old man. And I realized you can't really do that for the Legend of Zelda, it's at least not for another 20 years. Maybe you could have that if you were dealing with time travel as like an alternate, like, hey, you go and meet yourself from the future and you're a brawler, like that could be cool. But if you're designing the main character, you always want that same kind of a vibe as what you've always been giving the players from the very first game in that series. And that's something that the greatest, the greatest series of all time always repeat, not, not repeat, but echo the same sort of rhyme and you want to keep those things and identify those and if you're if you're uh, struggling with something like that and it's a, it's a great practice by the way to just redesign characters uh, of your favorite characters if you wanted to do that try to like identify what are the shapes are there symbols that the character wears it's so important that you know the characters it's like when uh, cloud strife was suddenly thrust into being more realistic looking in proportion and detail and all that for the all the Final Fantasy VII remakes, they were very conscious to keep the same pendant and the same uh, hairstyle and just translate that to the modern, you know? Those are the things that you can't just suddenly change. You can't just suddenly change Cloud Stripe's hairstyle. 
You can't suddenly change the Triforce. You can't turn it into the O Force. You can't turn it. You can't change the uh, or, or the you know Penta Force or whatever. You can't change what what was there. You can't change his iconic elements. It was really bold for them to even suggest reducing the green down to this small amount of bluish green that's just between his outfit. You know, like that was bold. It maybe not so bold to get rid of his. He used to be bare legged. <laughs> By the way, if you look at like 1980s Link, he he didn't even wear pants. He just wore like a skirt, you know, kind of a thing, like a like a hoplite or something. But anyway, um, you want to identify what those key ingredients that really resonate about that character. Identify those things and carry them over into your modernized version of it, or even your stylized version of it. And that in and of itself is quite a challenge, especially if uh, your job on a game is to design alternate armors that still remind the player that, that you're playing as Link, for example. Really, tri really tricky, really challenging, and um, a lot of fun. I've had a lot of fun doing a lot of uh, uh, similar things with various characters in the games that I've worked on. I hope that this video was insightful for you. Uh, it's I love video games. I love working in video games. I love designing for video games, if you can't tell. This is truly my passion. Even after 20 years of doing it, it's my favorite thing in the world. I wanna thank you for coming along for the ride for this. If you listen to the whole video, I hope you come out of it with a couple of drawings for yourself and maybe some new ideas on things that you could incorporate into your own designs and your own portfolio. And of course, if you're looking to get into the game industry, I wanna wish you all the best of luck. I have very deep breakdowns of my process of what I actually go through when I'm designing environments. And, uh, and characters for the video games I've worked on. I've created workshops for those so that I don't have to come to your house and show you personally. Uh, you can just like brain, download my brain dump, basically. <laughs> I've like Neo, I just created a program that allows you to just download everything that I know about the, the games that I've worked on and how to design for them over on my Gumroad channel. I'm still running a sale as you can check the screen. For that code right now. I've also lowered the price on everything because I can't stand with inflation. Everything's getting more expensive and I wanted to just make something cheaper. So I thought it was a little bit, you know, ridiculous that everything gets more expensive. I just wanted to make this these workshops and tutorials more available for everybody so uh, that you can find success in a career in working in video games or making comics. I have workshops on that as well. So I want to wish you the best of luck. Please do uh, subscribe. And I'd like to know your thoughts on games that I should take a look at their art book. If you have a particular art book in mind, I'd love to hear about it. I love being introduced to new things. And uh, I'd also love it if you come back and subscribe and ring that bell. And I will see you in the next video. All right, ciao.